Kiwi Seed, I'm going to give you a bit of a talk on growing high yielding irrigated sorghum. Uh, some people might be wondering why you would bother to try and, try and irrigate grain sorghum. It's a good dry land crop, might be swimming upstream a little bit here, but hopefully I'll change your mind once you see some of the results that we've, uh, that we've had in the last year or two. Uh, this project basically come out of some limited irrigation work and we sort of saw how little water we were using and how good the yields we were getting. Everything I'm going to show you has been based on the Darling Downs, so it's flood irrigation, soils that hold 250, 280 mils of water, so pretty good soils, probably equivalent to Liverpool Plains, Breezer, so some of the stuff that Loretta's doing as well. Some acknowledgements, uh, particularly two growers, Dave and Jane Lufton and the Bly family of Brookstead. Um, they've donated quite a bit of land and water and time for about five years now. Um, with no charge, so they've, they've been instrumental in getting the work done. And Alan Peake and Greg McLean from Syro have helped me with some modelling and some soil water management uh, and some measurements. So take home message, can we grow high yielding sorghum? Yes we can. And I think we can do it reliably, so year to year, even though we've got all this environmental fluctuation that we've got to deal with, with less water than a lot of other crops. Um, the last couple of years we're probably using half the water as a maize crop on the same farm. So we're using two irrigation versus four for similar yields. It's easier to grow and I think there's some benefits to cotton in the rotation as well. And it's pretty profitable, especially when the money's where it is. 12 tonne of grain sorghum at $300 a tonne, it's pretty easy to do the mass. It doesn't cost a lot of money to grow sorghum. So the aim of the research was to improve the yield to start with. I wanted to benchmark it to so that we, if we're not getting to where we need to, we, we know about it and we can look at why we're not getting there. Um, and I wanted to develop a system that would work in with the, with the cotton system. So it worked well with the rotation. It's easy to grow, high water use efficiency, and I'll show you a few numbers that we've generated out of the project. It's got great um, drought tolerance. Better heat tolerance than maize, we've already talked about maybe making some improvements there which will make it more robust. Um, it's got a low water use requirement and prices are high and I think Ross is going to talk about some of the exciting future for sorghum as a food product rather than a, an animal product that hopefully keep those prices high. So first off we wanted to work out what was achievable and I've, I feel like this a little bit trying to sell irrigated sorghum to people but um, hopefully I'll lift that one day. So we started off, and a little bit like Scott put up before, we wanted to know whether we could actually model it. So we put in the data that we had out of our water timing work, plus there's some small plot dry land trials down the bottom end here. Got a very good uh, relationship with the model, with the APSIM model, so we could model irrigated grain sorghum yields. And you can see, you know, in our two watered system, we were getting up around that 11, 11 half tonne per hectare. Oh, I broke it. You eat? What'd you do? <laughs> Use it. No. I'll just say no and see what happens. Not long there. Genius. So <laughs> then we wanted to have a look at well, what's what's our potential? You know, what should we target? So we have probability of receiving a particular yield, so around that 11 ton, and we've got two waters and one water over here. So for the better environments, there's not a lot of difference between one water and two water. So a lot of years, we're only going to need one irrigation to achieve full irrigation on grain sorghum. And it sort of peaks out around that 11 and a half tonne. So that, we wanted to beat that. So that was our initial target. From a water use point of view, you've got two waters and one waters. Again, probability of using a certain amount of water. And it ranges around that 550 to 600 mils total water use. So about six meg, five and a half meg. Uh, that doesn't include any losses, so you've got to factor in losses and efficiency as well. One of the things we did do is look at water use and use a different, couple of different models by different valleys to see whether we could do this in other areas. Um, and surprisingly, if you manipulate sowing date to get out of your heat periods, which we talked about earlier, there's not a lot of difference between the valleys on the total water required to grow an irrigated sorghum crop. So once we're finished with the downs, we hope to expand this out to some other areas and just see what, what we can get in those hotter environments. So what is the yield potential? What are we missing out on? Uh, is the model showing us the top end and we can't beat that? 
We've measured up to 25 kilos per millimetre in irrigated sorghum as a water use efficiency, and we haven't measured any losses. So no drainage or runoff in this, so potentially it's higher than that. I don't have the equipment to do that. So we've got grain yield this way and water pushed through the crop or the ET requirement that way. If we're averaging around 550 <coughs> mils, 13 tonne is the target. If we can maintain that sort of water use efficiency, so by that theory, the more water we push through it, the higher the yield potential. Unfortunately, if you use the same hybrid and you have a really high ET requirement, it means it was hotter. And it's hotter, your efficiency drops. So having more water go through the plant is not necessarily a good thing. It can be a negative. Your other option is to grow a longer season hybrid. So we're out there for longer. Um, and the two, two crops we've grown so far, one flowered in 85 days and the other one flowered in 65. So it'll be really interesting to see what the yields difference is between the two. But the longer we can keep that crop out there and push water through it, potentially the higher the yield. But so is the higher the water use as well. So what are some of the roadblocks and, and opportunities? This water timing is the single biggest one that I've seen just travelling around. Um, because it's sorghum, it's tough, it's used as a dry land crop. If we're only going to allocate one water or two waters to it, the old, the old information, I guess, is that you've got to have it wet at flowering. But we're stressing it really early. And that's when we're building our yield. So we're waiting and waiting and waiting. If we have a look at this photo, it's a pretty, pretty good example. That's a one watered sorghum at Breezer. Did four and a half tonne. He watered it at flowering, had no rain up to flowering. Got 280 mils after flowering. If he had used his water earlier, he probably could have fitted two waters in at a lower deficit. He probably would have got 10 or 11 tonne. So just holding that water off for too long reduces your yield potential. I've got a heap of info if people want to have a look at that, but I haven't got time to look at it today. So management issue, we haven't really done a lot around the management of irrigated sorghum, so row configuration, nitrogen timing, and some new hybrids. We're using dry land hybrids. If we put a, uh, a hybrid selected for irrigation, we might add another tonne or two to that. <laughs> And plant stand evenness, I think that's important as well. Probably not as important as some of the other factors, but it's definitely going to be important. Very quickly, all our yield is developed in the pre-flowering stage. So we don't look after the plant there. We can water all we want at the back end. And on these better soils, we're holding 250 mils. That's enough to finish a crop. That's half the water requirement. So if we can get the flowering and be full, a lot of the time we're not going to need any more irrigation after that. So waiting until after flowering on a lot of our better soils is a waste of time. We need to set the right plant number at planting. We need a good root system early. And around this day 35, we're setting grain number. So if we stress the plant, and if you had no rain, and you've got a crop this high, it'll be in stress. And the deficit's probably 40 or 50 mils. So if you wait for 100 mils, the crop's gonna be pretty ugly by then. So last year's trial, High yielding sorghum project, just to let you know that it wasn't all beer and skittles on the Darling Downs, it was pretty similar to everywhere else. We, I managed to time flowering at 42 degrees, so it was the hottest part of the year, I don't know, it's great <laughs> work. But when I was there at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it was stinking hot in the head ditch, walked into the crop, felt like 8 degrees cooler, because it was well watered, complete canopy closure and there was still pollen shedding at three in the arvo, which is very unusual. So we didn't see any of those heat effects, even in the buster, which is probably not as tolerant as the Scorpio. Um, we still had pollen and we had a micro environment in a well-watered crop, even though we had hot temperatures. And we got bugger all rain. So it was in the bottom 10% of years from 125 years of weather data. So to try and grow high yielding sorghum, it was a pretty tough season to you know, start off we had two hybrids, Buster and Scorpio. Scorpio is a newer high yielding line. We had three plant populations and we had two row configurations. So we had the standard 40 inch solid and we had a twin row which was 15 centimetres wide and it was centred on that 40 inch. And I'll show you a picture, it's a bit easier to show. So that was our twin row versus our solids. Why would we go to a twin? Well, as soon as you decrease your plant spacing under 10 centimetres, the head size shrinks, so your grain number just reduces. So you put more plants there, you just get smaller heads, you don't increase your grain yield. You increase the competition, 
increase your risk of, uh, of stress, I think. So the idea was let's split it. We'll get nice big heads, double the size, double the grain number. We put more plants <coughs> in there. We should double the yield. Didn't quite work out that way, but um, that was the theory. We wanted to leave the 40 inch area um, free to plant cotton in next year. So in a zero till type situation, uh, we wanted to reduce the time of canopy closure, which it does. So by knee high, you've got no bare ground showing. It'll close in. So any water you put on has got to go through the plant rather than through evaporation. And through that canopy closure, try to improve our weed control as well. So very quick summary of it. The Scorpio out yielded the Buster by 1.37 tonne. So it's top end yield under twin row, which added another 387, which was statistically different, uh, was 12.6. But we had one plot in particular there that did a bit over 13. So it really gave us a lot of encouragement that in a pretty tough season that we could achieve those sorts of yields. And I guess we had a look at it and say, well, can we do it again? There's a little picture of what we were trying to do. That's the buster yield on solid rows, 115. You add Scorpio, you add a different management. And I think a lot of the time these little management changes are going to give us small increments of yield. Mightn't give us those big jumps, but you've got to keep adding them all on top of each other. Population wise, very flat across all treatments and all hybrids. Had a huge amount of tillering, which I can't really explain, even at the high plant populations on 40 inch rows. Massive amount of tillering. So when we did the head counts, I had 21 heads in every treatment. It didn't seem to matter. If the Buster was a similar to the Scorpio, just different size heads. From a water use point of view, there are the numbers. In uh, effective in-crop rainfall, much lower than the long-term average. In-crop irrigation, much higher. There's our ET requirement compared to the long-term average. We ended up with 50 mils left in the profile. So it was pretty dry by the end of it. You know, we had nearly had a 230 mil deficit, no lodging. Screen, no screenings, hectolitre weights were about 84. So it was a pretty nice crop. So 2014-15 trial, a couple of things we wanted to improve on is the water timing, especially on the high plant populations. We thought maybe we missed it a little bit early and they were going through the water a little quicker maybe than the lower plant populations. We want to improve our plant stand. We used a single row monosome, which we double planted and shifted on the GPS to do it, which meant we had to run over with the planter wheel one row, so it wasn't ideal. And we wanted to widen our twin row out a little bit to just give the, room, the plants a little bit more room and look at some new hybrids. So we did have a reasonable deficit coming in sort of around that day 45. It didn't look stressed to the eye, it looked quite good, but that was one of the things we just wanted to look at. Plant stand evenness, so there's our twin row. You know, we did have some gaps in it, which would have contributed to some of the tillering. We bought a new planter. Uh, precision planting make these boxes with it's called a V-set with an electric drive. It's the best singulation I've seen in grain sorghum ever. It's almost flawless. That's, a, that's the planter we built for this job. So it's got auto downforce, electric drives. It's a brand new type of meter. If anyone wants to have a look at it or wants to see a demo of it, we're using it in our dryland trials as well. It does a fantastic job. And that's a picture of the result. So there's 230,000, singulated perfectly on a twin row, um, looking sensational at that stage. We were going to harvest this trial this, this week, but we, it's still a little bit damp, so it'll be in next week, so we'll see what we get off it. Put some moisture probes in to help with our water decisions. Didn't really need it with the way things panned out. We had pretty good rainfall. We added a couple of waters, but the last water in particular we probably didn't need. And we put in a pretty big trial. We've got 800 pretty close to finished hybrids looking for better material for irrigation. And there's some hybrids in there that look like they're a ton or more better than Scorpio. So there is some material which will lift the yield again, I think. They're all on single rows, so it's a little bit hard to say what they'll look like on twins. So we changed things a little bit. We put a longer season stay green hybrid, Apollo, which is quite new, that's yielded well for us. We put that in against the Scorpio. Nothing is the bust is quite old, but it was designed for dry land. It works from central Queensland all the way to Liverpool Plains, but has a yield cap under good conditions. <coughs> Expanded our populations a little bit, and we widened that twin row. So that's what we changed.
nearly about here. Um, side dressed some urea, 200 kilos, had a little bit of leaf burn out of that. And the idea was that we were going to water on crop stage regardless of deficit. So we're going to keep it out of stress. Had 35 mils of rain there, so we actually washed that in beautifully, didn't need to irrigate. So we didn't get our first water on until day 58. Flowering was 70 to 75 days, and that was uh, 10 to 15 days faster than the year before. So there's a little bit of a concern about the yield potential, given that we're much quicker. So a very different year. We were hotter earlier in this trial with a cool wet finish, and the year before we were sort of cool start with a hot dry finish, so a very opposite. Uh, then we put another water on at the start of grain field, mainly for some late season hybrids in the hybrid trial to make sure that we didn't penalise them because they're later season. And it was sprayed out at 113 days, which is pretty quick. Water-wise, uh, 40 to 50 mil water and an 80 to 90 mil water. We've had probably 112 mils of rainfall when the profile's full, so we've had more rainfall than we've needed for the season. Yield potential. I think it's better than last year's to look at it and I think there will be population response because we don't have any tillers at the lower populations for some reason. Um, I did some hand cuts because I thought Cyclone Marshall was going to wreck it. <laughs> we might never see it again. So I thought I'll cut some just to give you an idea and it looks like somewhere between 12 and a half and 13 and a half tonne. It looks good even though it was a very quick crop. One of the nice benefits is that's peach vine in solid robusta. It's come late in the season because this is pigeon pea this ground so not the best for controlling peach vine in. No. There's your twin row Apollo. Very, very good suppression of those late weeds. I might skip that one. So next season, we want to compare. We're going to plant some cotton in the twin row. He's going to prepare the single rows as he would normally and we'll just do a straight out comparison to see what it looks like. We'll do the twins and the solid again. I think the twins will out yield the solid again this year and it looks like it'll be more than last year. Whether it's enough to pay for a twin row plant is another thing. Um, we want to look at the nitrogen management. We're going to retest the, probably the top 10 or 20% of the hybrids in the, in the hybrid trial. And it's all insect control. We got everything up, but we had earwig issues after we got the plants up, which really pissed me off. But um, because we've done such a good job getting it up that they ate it afterwards was a bit of a concern. So we're going to look at that as well. And a final note, something that didn't get a lot of attention was a grower in Common grew 20 tonne of grain sorghum in a single year by returning a crop of Scorpio. So he had two paddocks. The average yield was 10 tonne across them, but his best paddock was 11 tonne on the first crop, followed by a 9 tonne return crop. And for those who don't know what a return crop is, it's just you don't spray out, you mulch down to the sixth node, water and fertilise and let it go again. It's not new technology, it was really popular in the 80s bit like perms, they're coming back. Um, so these, you had a water up plus two, three waters on the, on the return crop, total nitrogen he applied, and it took 224 days. Potentially, we could get this done at Dolby, more re windy maybe. Add the biofilm maybe to get started earlier. It, it, it's got some potential. Um, yeah, and I thought that was a... I probably could have got a little bit more press than it did at 20 tonne, and it was $300 a tonne he sold it for, so it was a pretty profitable year for, for sorghum. So I'll leave it at that, Huey. So.